Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Currency Exchange, a NatWest Markets podcast all about foreign exchange markets. I'm Brian Dangerfield, and I'll be your host today. And I'm happy to be joined by my co-head of G10FX Strategy here at NatWest, Paul Robson. Paul, welcome back, and thanks for joining. Yeah, thanks very much for the uh, invitation. It certainly feels a good time to be back after the you know school holidays, summer holidays. Looking to, forward to you know the run into the end of the uh, year. So thanks so much for the uh, invitation. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it has been a summer holiday. Uh, you know, we're now back from summer holidays. Uh, markets are back. Students are back in school, and it certainly feels like the market has a bit of a back to school type feeling to it as well. You know, we are coming out of a very interesting month of August where the dollar has performed quite well. Oh, what are some of the key themes you? Uh, what are some of the key themes from over the summer and ones that you think are going to persist uh, in the coming months as we sort of head into the last stretch of the uh, 2023? Yeah, I actually think there's quite a few new themes that have developed over. Uh, the summer, and I, I think a lot of them will be uh, persisting into the end of the year, and it will certainly sort of uh, see our thinking, I think, change on some of the the major uh, currencies. I mean, for me, the main theme over the the summer was the weakness of the euro area economy uh, and weakness of the China uh, recovery. And before we went away at the sort of mid uh, July period, I think we sort of suspected that was going to happen. The new area data were weakening. Some of the China data weren't really that that strong. And it was one of the reasons why, you know, you and I decided to go neutral on, on euro dollar because it's the, a sort of bellwether uh, currency in terms of relative growth uh, between the rest of the world and, and the, the US. But I think that's just um, continued and maybe uh, got a little bit stronger in terms of uh, the impact on, on markets, some of the PMIs that we've been getting uh, have been very, very weak. And that's all come at the same time as we've got US data resilience, maybe 2.0, for example. Um, the data have held up uh, better than expected. And I always steal your, uh, one of your um, favorite themes about that the data in the US are weakening, but they're not weakening in a vacuum. Everyone is weakening and the US is performing relatively well. And um, that's seen rate divergence and, and the dollar do uh, relatively well. So I think that's one of the, the key themes. And when we look to the final months of the year, to what extent does that malaise in uh, European growth continue? And, and um, also about whether uh, the data in China continue to, uh, to weaken. Um, the other key point, I think, for markets has been the extent to which we're a bit more confident that the global policy tightening cycle is over. Now, there might be a couple of central banks who are going to uh, tighten a little bit more, but generally speaking, I think we're more confident, markets are more confident, inflation is coming lower, central banks are done uh, tightening. And for the rest of the year, I think it's going to be about um, sort of playing that easing cycle you know, the timing of the first cuts from central banks, the pace of cuts and the ultimate depth of the easing cycle. And I think that's going to be what we're all talking about uh, through the rest of the year. Um, a couple of other sort of quick themes. One has been uh, sterling resilience. Uh, I must admit, I, you know, I've been underweight sterling. I was a bit cautious on uh, sterling, but it, it feels like uh, the data has held up a little bit better than people expected. Again, in that sort of it hasn't been weakening in a vacuum. Uh, and maybe it's just the absolute high level of UK yields that have had more impact on currency markets. I actually thought growth would matter uh, more. And I think that's important. So whether that persists, I think, is uh, something we can uh, talk about later, perhaps. Uh, the other one is uh, the dollar rally testing the patience of some monetary authorities. Uh, the two sort of that spring to mind are the... Uh, Ministry of Finance in, in Japan and the Chinese monetary uh, authorities. You could probably throw in a little bit of Ritz Bank and Norges Bank there, but that that's going to be uh, important as well. And the final theme over the summer, um, since we've been away, is the resilience of the oil price. So actually, oil price gains through, 100, through the 200-day moving average. Um, to what extent that's going to persist and, importantly, why it's going up uh, in terms of supply and demand. And I think that's something that that, um, currency markets will uh, look into. So taking that all together, a pretty busy uh, summer when markets are meant to be relatively um, 
quiet, but there's a lot to digest for the rest of the year. Yeah, I think absolutely. And the theme that I think really resonates with me of the ones that you brought up is this idea of relative growth and relative growth expectations where you have, you've really seen where you've seen the biggest delta in expectations, the biggest change has been in the Euro area and China, whereas in the US you have seen um, a moderation, I think it's fair to say, but that moderation has really been only on the edges rather than a uh, much more clear, consistent slowdown that you've seen um, in other economies. And I think it's also right to say that the U.S. is a relatively closed economy, does not rely that heavily on exports. It doesn't rely on external demand in the way a lot of other economies do. So you think about the negative externalities that come with weaker growth offshore has a larger impact on most other currencies and a little bit less impact on the dollar. And so, like you said, the sort of US dollar exceptionalism 2.0 certainly feels like we're in that kind of environment now with services, uh, ISM index that we got this week, um, surprised to the upside, while a lot of the PMI services across Europe and in China are surprised on the downside. And I know for Euro dollar specifically, we do have the ECB next week. It certainly feels like most central banks, like you said, are heading towards a pause point. Um, relative growth, I know euro dollar is one that's very, it's, we think it's very linked to euro dollar. What are you thinking about euro dollar here as we're testing uh, towards some important levels on the downside? Yeah, no, you're exactly right. Testing some important uh, levels, the sort of area between sort of 105, 106.50. If we start going through that, I, I think that you could get a quite a significant change of uh, sort of market sentiment towards this important bellwether. Uh, currencies, as I think we've mentioned in the past, euro, dollar, dollar, C and H are important anchors for the major economies. And if euro dollar is going lower, uh, then the dollar is probably doing relatively well against a whole range of currencies. And um, for euro dollar, we sort of peaked back in early uh, July at around just over 112. We were down to 107. So it's not a dramatic uh, weakening in the currency. Uh, but what I would say is it's largely following its usual drivers. There's nothing truly unexpected about this weakness uh, in euro dollar. When we, we look at relationships in the past and we put those into our short-term models, they're, they're all linked to like monetary policy. They're what the policy rates do in short-end rates, as I would say, um, slope of the relative curves in the US versus Europe in terms of bond markets. And there's also the spreads in European government bond markets. And you put all that together um, and euro dollar has gone from being just a little bit too high to uh, just a little bit too low uh, here, but not not dramatically so. Um, the other point I would say is that despite all that relative growth that we've been talking about and data surprises, that our measure of fair value has been relatively flat for six months. I mean, it's drifting a little bit lower now, but not dramatically so. So it feels like euro dollar stays in the range unless we... Uh, start taking out those uh, levels. Um, the only point, the other point I'd say about euro dollar is, is interesting, isn't it? About um, dollar uh, U.S. resilience that we've spoken about, and at the same time, sort of a more negative outlook for Europe and China. At some point, that becomes better price. And as we um, titled the FX Weekly last week, we had peakism, so we're having like peak optimism in the states and peak pessimism in, in Europe, and certainly data surprises sort of hint at that uh, on both sides of the, the Atlantic. So if I'm honest, I'm not really expecting very much from uh, euro dollar. I think we'll need some reassessment of the rate outlook for the ECB and the Fed. Um, it looks like the, you know, the ECB is close to the, the top, probably the, the Fed, but inflation pressures seem a little bit weaker. Uh, in the US, despite that relatively um, stronger, resilient uh, economy, and well, how quickly does the Fed react to that? Um, and we think that they might lead at some point uh, the ECB, but we're in this sort of plateau of rates at the moment, um, and that just keeps you a dollar, unfortunately, in its ranges, uh, and perhaps not as exciting as um, we we might like. I think that's right, and that makes a lot. That certainly makes a lot of sense to me. One thing you brought up was the move lower in euro and higher in dollar does seem to trace with fundamentals. And whether a move trace with fundamentals is very, very important in a number of uh, currencies in Asia, specifically the yen. You know, we have seen the yen has weakened 
uh, quite a bit against the dollar, but not just against the dollar. In trade-weighted terms, it's also down quite a bit. Now, when the Bank of Japan made their surprise tweak to yield curve control back in July, that I think was seen by many as an opportunity for monetary policy in Japan to maybe uh, converge a little bit with monetary policy in the rest of the world and for relative rates to maybe move a bit in its favor and support the yen. In fact, the opposite has really happened where yen has weakened um, against a wide array of currencies, uh, including the dollar. So what are you thinking about yen here? There's certainly a lot of discussion of the possibility of uh, intervention from monetary authorities, not just in Japan, but certainly in China as well. But I do want to ask about Japan. Uh, what are you thinking? What do you think needs to be seen for intervention? Do you think this move that we've seen is in line with fundamentals? Well, it's largely in line, and certainly on our models, when we looked at uh, dollar yen against interest rate um, expectations, whether it's like the two year interest rate or a five or a, a 10, it, it's largely uh, mapping that that line. So, in your words, it's, it's following fundamentals. Uh, the authorities in Japan might be just a little bit uh, uncomfortable by the, the pace and the sort of direction uh, of the, the move. Maybe they think it's um, bordering line on being a speculative uh, move, even though it's in, in line with uh, fundamentals. Um, we are getting to, to levels that traditionally, I think the authorities have been a little bit uncomfortable with some of the, the sort of verbal in, uh, intervention rhetoric sort of um, increased uh, this week. And it shows that the authorities are getting a little bit more uh, uncomfortable. So. Uh, in terms of how far we can go, I think it is a function of uh, intervention and, and maybe the verbal intervention for now uh, will be enough. Given that the global economy is slowing and the US data are slowing, they're not um, continuing to surprise to the, uh, the upside. So I, I think the authorities won't be particularly happy with the move. But again, I, I don't think they think it's unwarranted. Uh, and certainly other asset prices in Japan don't sort of hint that there's market dislocation and, and things like that. And looking forward, I, I think that the yen is going to be super important, super um, focused by markets over the next sort of year. If we think about what I said at the beginning about confidence in the global policy tightening cycle is over, well, the yen was the weakest currency through that tightening cycle. And if we are moving to the next phase of this, which is eventually it will be uh, cutting rates in in the US and, and globally, uh, then that would hint at the the yen recovering uh, and potentially recovering quite quite significantly. But it's picking that that point, uh, that inflection point in central bank policy, which I, uh, that just leaves the the main focus for markets, uh, monetary policy tightening, uh, moving into easing. And as I said earlier, you know, the timing, the speed, the depth of that. But um, the yen is going to be front and center. I think we're all going to be talking about the yen. Uh, for the best part of the next 18 months. And we had to watch that. Well, that's almost certainly going to be right. I mean, you think about uh, the end of the year last year when the Fed was moving away from hiking uh, 75 at 75 basis point clips, starting to talk about slowing down the pace of tightening. And then uh, ultimately, you had some weaker data into the end of 2022 and into early 2023. And you had a quite significant shift lower in dollar yen on the back of that, that moves lower in rates. Um, of course, at the time, there was the surprise change to yield curve control policy in December of 2022, but Japan just does not have any control over its yield differentials. Policy, by definition, extremely low rates. Uh, yield curve control, loosened a bit, but still yield curve control, means that relative interest rate differentials are almost exclusively driven by what's going on offshore. And so as we're heading into an environment where rates feel like they're peaking and will eventually start to come down, that's probably going to be the one currency where I think the market's going to be most enamored with the possibility of a real change in the in the story. But I think what we have learned over the last couple of months is that this is a trade, you know, being short dollar yen when that time comes, it, you know, you could certainly have that move, but the market would be, uh, the market could certainly be caught off guard by a false start. Uh, we've had a couple of false starts in terms of the Fed cycle um, earning. Um, and, you know, I think the market may still be a little bit on guard of that, but I feel like the yen is going to be one where that's, I think the way you said it is really it is right. Is that's going to be one that has is really important uh, as we look at the transition in the cycle away from tightening and towards uh, pauses and eventual easing. Um, one currency and one economy that I feel like is almost the poster child for the counterplay between 
higher rates and slower growth that could come. You know, we talk a lot about relative rates. Relative growth is important for currencies. But one currency in particular that I think really stands out is sterling. That rates have been rising in the UK. They've had to be more aggressive because inflation has been higher in terms of tightening uh, policy. But growth, you know, the concerns about growth down the road from that need to tighten uh, have really started to ramp up. And certainly in our view, you mentioned, Paul, that we've been certainly more cautious on sterling because of those growth risks down the road. But if you look at currency performance within the G10 since the start of August, sterling is actually towards the top of the league table in terms of you know everything is down against the dollar um, over this period. But sterling is actually one of the better performers. It feels like yield's probably a part of that story. Uh, what are you thinking about sterling here? Um, and how do you feel about this balance between nominal rates, which you know are quite high in, in the UK versus these growth risks, which you think are pretty significant? Yeah, I, I think you described it very well. You sort of mentioned that league table of um, currencies during the, the summer and sterling has been to the um, top of that. We've got a saying here in the UK, the table never lies when it comes to sort of premiership football and things like that. So, that, you know, a team's performance, currency performance um, is shown in the table and, uh, and it is what it is. Um, I said in my opening comments that sterling had traded a little bit more strongly than we um, had anticipated. And um, it, and I think it is that balance between relative growth and yield. And I think markets put a, a greater weight on the absolute level of yield than they do on uh, relative growth that, say, I do. Because I thought growth was important, particularly important, because the UK has this current account deficit. Growth drives capital flows, um, sort of short-term capital flows, but also uh, FDI, for example, and, and importantly, equity uh, flows that can be unhedged. And that, that matters for a current account deficit economy like the, the UK. And, and that's still the uh, case. And I think that's still important. Uh, supporting the currency, I think some of the comments from the the central bank this week, from the, the governor of the Bank of England and their chief economist, while they sort of suggested that maybe we're close uh, to peak rates here in the UK, I, I don't think that's a a particularly sort of shocking comment to to hear, but just to hear it, I, I think it is important. But the other point is this idea of you know table mountain sort of description of the policy rate in the UK because we've got this higher inflation rates stay higher for longer than they do in other economies, and just to what extent that supports sterling uh, a little bit more. But I, I think it is that relative data resilience with sort of. You know, the dollar's little brother, if you want. Um, you know, we talked about US uh, resilience 2.0, maybe in the UK, it's a similar kind of thing. But I think we are now approaching a very, very important period for the UK economy in sterling. And that's that, again, it's that return to school, the end of the summer holidays, a lot of activity you know, has been supported by higher savings over COVID. Um, and maybe some of the holidays over the summer were um, um, sort of carried over from COVID. But now the reality hits of stubbornly high inflation and crucially uh, mortgage rate reset uh, risks, given the, the shift in you know, the policy rate from zero to 5%, that ultimately is going to matter. And what's important for the UK is the delayed impact of that. I mean, I would describe it as delayed transmission mechanism. But the fact that the effective rates that households are seeing at the moment isn't the sort of 5% because we have fixed rate mortgages of two to five year. But as that sort of exerts, I, I, I think that the balance shifts from that focus on absolute yield back to relative growth and the current account. So we're, we're happy to stay sort of underweight the currency, uh, but I have to admit we're, we're a little bit more vigilant, we're a little bit more cautious, maybe a little bit less confident than we were at the beginning uh, of the summer. So lots, lots to uh, digest there. Yeah, I think we, because we're in a period where it seems most central banks are heading towards a pause period, certainly feels like, you know, sterling is going to be one of the currencies in the G10, which ends this cycle with nominal rates towards the top. And from a carry perspective, you know, uh, this is an environment where it feels very difficult to lean against um, carry more broadly. I mean, within the G10, especially, you know, it's a different conversation in emerging markets, of course, uh, where carry is dominated. But you know, the U.S. and the U.K. are ones towards the top end in terms of nominal rates, and that's provided support, I think, in both cases. Um, and I think that that this critical period you mentioned for the U.K., I think it's a, a, certainly a very critical period where 
and we continue to see relatively solid performance because of nominal rates, or do we start to get a little more concerned about growth because those rates are high? You mentioned one more thing, and I want to end on this. Um, oil prices and you know some other industrial commodities uh, like iron ore prices, those have seen some su perhaps surprising increases recently. You know, you have oil prices effectively at the 2023 highs, despite a lot of this discussion we've had has, has been sort of downtrodden in terms of growth. You know, think about the data in China have been weaker. There have been concerns about consumer demand. There's been concerns about the property market in China. The data in Europe has slowed. Pessimism in Europe, I think, has picked up, certainly. But if you look at some industrial commodity prices, it feels like you're getting a different sort of picture that you have oil prices are high um, and industrial models are high. You know, in the G10 space, you know, there are, you know, when you look at oil prices, there are really two currencies that come to mind. There's Norway on your side of the Atlantic and Canada on my side of the Atlantic. But neither of those seem to be really getting that much support from these higher energy prices. What do you think about the signal from oil prices uh, into these currencies? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a super interesting point. I mean, you've widened it out from oil into industrial commodities. And, and for a world maybe where we think inflation has peaked, you know, if we start getting higher energy prices, commodity prices, food prices, um, maybe that could shake the market sort of consensus and, and narrative. And we definitely have to, to watch that. Uh, for uh, Norwegian um, krona, for example, I, I think it's always down to why the oil price is rising and the impact on the, the currency. If the oil price was rising because world demand was picking up strongly, the China recovery suddenly kicks into gear, Europe is doing better, demand's rising, oil price outstripping supply, then that's a, a more positive environment for the Norwegian krona because the Norwegian krona has a positive correlation with sort of positive market sentiment. So for example, if um, equity markets are going up and people feel quite confident, uh, then the Norwegian krona tends to gain with the, the higher oil price. And at the moment, um, that sort of market sentiment is a little bit more cautious uh, and that's why. Um, and also the higher oil price is undermining that, that sort of confidence in markets because if you uh, and consumers and businesses spend uh, money on um, energy and food, you, you spend less on all the other stuff that makes the economy uh, tick. So that that's important. So Euro Norway, for example, isn't doing anything that you would you wouldn't expect. So it's following interest rate expectations. It's sort of following the oil price, but crucially, it's following that sort of measure of how optimistic markets um, are. I, I think that uh, ultimately we probably get a little bit of downside for Euro Norway, but not not dramatically. But it's that production cuts um, from OPEC that that matter. And as you wrote, um, sort of uh, late last year, you were talking about supply constraints, about infrastructure spending, the ability of uh, supply to to rise in the sort of rising demand env um, environment. And you were um, cautious, thinking that oil prices might might surprise the upside. So you know, well done there. That was a year ago almost. Um, so you'll see, had your um, crystal ball um, uh, ready, um, but. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's um, it, it it's why the oil price is going up, and I, I don't think it's because of demand, and that it's less positive uh, for Norwegian krona and probably the Canadian dollar. Yeah, I think it's very similar uh, for Canadian dollar. The reason why oil price is going up is obviously very important. Maybe the biggest difference between two, these two economies is where they are situated in the world. Right, Canada uh, has very very high connection to the U.S. consumer, which has been holding in pretty strong. Uh, Norway less so, uh, considering the growth data in Europe and uh, in Asia has uh, has not been as strong. And so that's probably an important difference between these two. Well, we've covered a lot today and we've gone through a lot of different themes as we look ahead to uh, the rest of the year. So I want to thank you all for joining. And I want to thank you as well for listening. Uh, if you liked this podcast, please consider uh, giving the podcast a like and subscribing to our channel uh, for additional NatWest Markets uh, economic and market strategy content. Thank you very much.